ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد او praise is due to Allah we praise him abundantly we seek Allah's assistance and we ask Allah's forgiveness and we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our souls and the consequences of our bad deeds whosoever Allah guides no one can lead astray and whosoever Allah allows to go astray because they do not want any guidance then no one can guide and I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of our worship except Allah alone with no partners and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a slave and his messenger may Allah exalt his mention grant him peace his companions wives and all those who follow them on the righteous path until the day of recompense now brothers and sisters in Islam truthfully speaking as I sit here and you sit there you must have a goal and objective in life everyone has a goal and some of these goals are common we share them and some of them are unique to each and every one of us that we don't really share them with others it's something that you want to establish you want to fulfill you want to accomplish in your life and many people may disagree with you or they may say that you know these goals of yours are nonsensical or they're not worthy or they're a waste of time and it is true some people have some weird goals that they waste a lot of time trying to accomplish some people spend a good half hour to an hour looking at the mirror for one hair that is going against the flow he put gel you know all kinds of detergents anything to fix one hair and it doesn't want to go with the flow and then oh, one hour you know and then they leave the house upset you know of course I don't have to worry about that one and so we say in the whole life their whole life is their hair looking fine or there's a mushkila. We say this is Akim Alish, you need to you know be a little more uh, you know easy going on yourself and try to utilize this time for something that is more beneficial and constructive. Some people have goals which are worthy. And it is very sad, it is very sad what I'm about, what I'm about to share with you. Believe it or not, there's one goal that none of us should be absent-minded about. And what I mean by us is Muslims all over the world. There's one goal which should be the ultimate goal that no two Muslims should ever disagree about. However, you will find that this is not the case. You will find that perhaps this goal had never come across someone's mind. A Muslim. Or, he thinks about it on some, he or she may think about it on occasions, then they soon forget about it. Or, Ramadan is one of them times, as what we are experiencing now, where people somehow start developing this longing, and then it soon dies out with the end of Ramadan sometimes before for some people it ends with the 27th because they feel if they've lived up to the 27th and they prayed in some masjid and the Imam screamed and they cried behind him khalas as if they get a guarantee that Allah forgave them but that is not our deen it is not about how loud your Ameen is it is not about how loud the Imam is it is not about how many tears you shed because of the dua. 
While, while the speech of Allah is being recited, we have absolutely nothing to offer. Then a human being starts running his mouth, you know, with a special kind of tune. And all of a sudden we feel that this is the, this is the khushu' which we were not supposed to get at that time. We were supposed to get it when the book of Allah was being recited. It's a little very intricate uh, issue that many people don't pay attention to. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? And who, whose speech affects you? The speech of Allah, which if it were to be sent down upon a mountain, you will find the mountain khashi'an mutasaddi'an min khashiyatillah or fulan who may commit shirk in his dua, who may say something to Allah which is not befitting. But we need to be careful about these ritualis, ritualistic understandings or let's call them innovations. Where people believe I cry in dua, it's the 27th, Khalas, once Ramadan is over or not even, once the night is over, then I can go back to my old ways. We say, brother and sister, you're dead wrong. What is that quality? What is that goal? What is that objective? Which should be the common objective of every Muslim in the world? That many people don't even think about or don't act upon what they have thought about Allah's love. Allah's love. Now pay attention. You may have it somewhere in the back of your mind. As in, yes, you know that being a Muslim has to do with attaining Allah's love. But there's a lot more to it than that. It is not merely maintaining the five obligatory prayers and fasting the month of Ramadan and paying zakah and doing Hajj and Umrah. These do not guarantee you Allah's love in the ultimate sense. Allah's love is beyond that. And Allah's love, as in Allah loving us, should be that thing which every one of us should make the goal of his life. As long as I'm alive, I wish to attain Allah's love with my shortcomings, with my sins, with my violations. Still, I want to attain Allah's love. And you will see as we quote the ayat, that among those who are qualified to attain Allah's love, are those who sin. Because we're not speaking to angels here. And we will not do everything correct every single time. And we will not lead a life of perfection. It's impossible. We will have our faults. We will have our shortcomings. However, if we as a way of life have adopted the way of attaining Allah's pleasure and seeking His love, Allah will make these times when we fall means of getting stronger means of developing stronger desire to attain Allah's love. So even a calamity does not put an end to your striving. It only makes you stronger in the future. We dealt in the lecture, do you really know him? About Allah's names and attributes. And we said, as people of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, who follow the way of the righteous predecessors, as Salaf al Salih, that we believe in whatever Allah described Himself with and whatever the Prophet ﷺ described Allah with without distorting the meaning, denying the meaning or likening Allah to His creation or you know things of this sort. The four uh, principles or the four exceptions to the rule. And based on this principle, one has to ask, does Allah actually love? If you say we want to attain Allah's love, you cannot speak about Allah's love unless you have an evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah that Allah actually loves. Because you will find among other religions, they don't have these kinds of reservations. They don't have this kind of cautiousness. So the average Christian, you meet any Christian walking down the street and you're bound to hear from him, God loves you. This is very, the easiest thing for them to say, God loves you. And I usually say, really? When did he tell you? <laughs> and like, ah, uh, uh, because God loves everyone. Really? Why is there a hellfire? Okay, I came across the wrong guy. Maybe God doesn't love you after all. Said, yes. You have no right to speak on behalf of Allah. You know, anybody you see, Allah loves you. Allah loves you. No. No, Habibi. No one has the right to tell someone else that Allah loves you. Because this is from ilmul ghaib, you don't know. We say 
Allah loves such and such fulan with such qualities, people with such qualities as the Quran and the Sunnah indicate, or those whom we have from the Sunnah, like among the Sahaba, those who the Prophet said to Allah loves you. Like Ali bin Abi Talib, the Prophet said that tomorrow he will give the flag for a man who Allah and his messenger love him and who loves Allah and his messenger. And that was Ali radiallahu anhu. This is a privilege. Allah and his messenger loved Ali radiallahu anhu arda. So we must look through the Quran and the Sunnah. Does Allah love? And if so, what am I supposed to do to acquire this love? You may ask why, what's the big deal? I'll tell you what the big deal is. Do you understand what I'm saying? When I say Allah loves you, Allah. Allah. What are we going to say about Allah? Read the whole Quran so you know who Allah is. Am I going to recite the Quran for you now? Do I have to recite the Quran for you in the end of Surah Al-Hashr? الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر عالم الغيب والشهادة all of these qualities am I have to, am I supposed to recite them to tell you who Allah is loves you who are you nothing sorry me or you don't think I'm saying you and I'm exempt who is one of us nothing nothing at the end of the day you're a sperm that developed into a human being. At some point in time, you were nothing but that. And what you will return to is nothing but dirt. Dirt. Nothing will be left of you except a tiny little bone. Then Allah will bring us back on the day of, the day of resurrection. So when we say Allah loves someone, or we want to attain Allah's love, we must understand that there is nothing absolutely nothing more virtuous and more valuable than that. Yani, you are walking down the street. Look, two men, two scenarios. Mr. Rich Guy with the fancy house or castle and the fancy car outside and the beautiful clothing and the beautiful wife and the lovely children and the this and that, you name it. He gets in his car to go buy something from the grocery store. And Fulan, his salary is not sufficient for him to survive. He can't find a wife. Um, his clothes are ripped, have holes in them, patches, whatever. And he doesn't have a car. He has to, you know, hitch a hike or something, has to find a way to get to his place, maybe bicycle, whatever. And he also goes to the grocery store. And while these two men are walking, or one is driving, feeling nice and lovely and whatever, and the other one is trying to find a way to get to the place, one Allah loves, and one Allah hates. Now, in our eyes, we say, Fulan, MashaAllah, Allah must love him, because look what he had given him. But that's not the standard in the sight of Allah. That person who may not have money, have nothing, nothing. If people some say, ah, get out of my face. I don't even want to chill with you. He could be in the sight of Allah equal to 10 billion like that other one. What is that distinction between them attaining Allah's love? This one whom Allah loves, He will put him in Jannah. At some point in time, He will be recompensed for the suffering. And this one who got it all going, at some point in time, he will also be recompensed for the pleasure and the delight. Why? He failed to attain Allah's love. He was arrogant. He was prideful. Maybe he didn't have the qualities which Allah loves. While this other one who didn't have all these worldly material, had all of the qualities which Allah loves. So at the end of the day, when they both die, what matters is, which one of them attained Allah's love? So, the question is, what are we willing to do to attain and acquire Allah's love? You may think it's difficult. Do you have to carry a mountain on your back? Or do you have to spend a lot of money? Or what is it that you have to do so you may attain Allah's love? None of that is necessary. Just read the Quran. 
Don't go far. Surah Al-Baqarah. You read Surah Al-Baqarah, three of the ayat which we will be quoting are in Surah Al-Baqarah. The first of which is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, Inna Allah yuhibbu at-tawwabin wa yuhibbu al-mutatahirin. Right. Now listen to this. Allah loves those who often repent to Him and He loves those who continuously purify themselves. What does it mean when you often repent? What does that suggest? That you don't sin? Would you repent if you didn't sin? Answer me! Would you repent if you didn't sin? No! You don't have a sin to repent from. Listen to what I'm saying. No one is free from sin. Don't you think that you don't sin? In case the shaitan has been tricking you to believe in that you don't sin, you're mistaken my friend. No, you sin. And because of these sins you have to seek repentance. If you didn't sin, you wouldn't seek repentance. If you didn't sin, you didn't make mistakes, you didn't err. But we do. So when Allah says, Inna Allah yuhibbu tawwabin, that means you have to look at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Kullu ibn Adam khatta wa khayru al-khatta ina tawwabun. Every son of Adam is prone to sin, has a tendency to sin, is a sinner, but not born sinful. And the best of those who do so, who fall into sin are those who repent. So each one of us has a share of attaining these sins or, or gaining, not even gaining, losing by sinning and disobeying Allah. And when you repent to Allah, Allah loves you. Yes, subhanAllah. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it beautiful that when you do something wrong and then you apologize, that you will act, you know, human let's let's look at it in human uh, human communication okay human relations if you had a friend and then he did something which is not right he wronged you he oppressed you when you apologize to him what usually happens yeah and if he's really nice and he really likes you he will let it slide but he will still have something in his heart still some some anger, some, some grudge, which you will not get rid of. Very often or very hardly, you will see someone who will wind up loving you more after you apologize. Wherein they forget about the whole thing. It doesn't happen. But with Allah Azza wa Jal, it's the other way around. You do something wrong, but you admit this wrong, and you beg Allah to forgive you, then Allah will love you for that. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. Because if that wasn't the case, we would be in trouble, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Wallahi, we'd be in big trouble. If every time we sinned, even if we repented, Allah did not love us or Allah hated us, by the time, by the time we die, we will have zero love. We wouldn't have any left. Because we will continue to attain Allah's hatred and displeasure until we die. But it works the other way around. You fall into sin, you repent to Allah, Allah will love you. Needless to say, the ulama say, if you don't sin to begin with, it is better. That is not encouraging anyone to sin and then do repentance. Because the shaitan will try to trick some people. Say, oh yeah? Tab yalla, let me go do A, B, C, D, F, G, and then I'll say, no, Habibi, no. If you have to leave things alone first, if you're unable and you wind up falling into sin, then this is when the tawbah is going to benefit you. This is the tawbah of the what? The cleansing of the what? The heart. وَيُحِبُّ الْمُتَطَهِّرِينَ And Allah loves those who physically purify themselves. Sheikh bin Uthaymeen rahimahu Allah ta'ala wa askanahu fasiha jannatih said something amazing which we hardly ever reflect on. He said, if you as a slave of Allah realized that every time you make wudu, you're attaining Allah's love, you would have felt very much different about the wudu which you perform. 
But truthfully speaking, when was the last time you felt when you're saying Bismillah and you're washing your hands, you're actually attaining Allah's love? Hardly ever. We're thinking this is a condition for Salah and I need to make wudu so my Salah can be valid. But we don't really reflect on the fact that this wudu is actually going to bring about Allah's love. Why? Absent-minded, heedless, illa man rahim Allah. But the good news is, every time you make wudu, every time you make ghusl, every time you use the bathroom and you clean yourself afterwards, you're attaining Allah's love. This is something which you have to do anyways, but if you do it for the sake of Allah, then you will attain Allah's love. So now you have, every time you purify yourself inwardly, Allah will love you. Every time you purify yourself outwardly, Allah will love you. Subhanallah al -Azim. Allah's love is readily available for those who acquire it. But it is not enough that we do these things out of ritualism. This is why we often repeat, Ya Ikhwan, the real iltizam, the real uh, adherence to the deen is not restricted to outwardly appearance. Look, there's a balanced approach. You'll find some people who say, you can look like whatever you want. You can shave your beard and can keep your trousers beneath, beneath your ankles and you could look like, you know, a rapper or, a, or a whatever. And ma fi mushkila. What matters is your heart. And we say you are wrong. You have no right to say that. Because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the opposite of what you're saying. He commanded us to do things which have to do with our outwardly appearance. And you have no right to undermine that or look at it as something insignificant. Rather, you must carry it out. That's one extreme. Don't worry about the outside. Fix your heart. Well, if your heart was fixed, your outside would have been fixed. If the battery is working, the phone will function. You have a nice looking phone, no battery. Hey, the heart is busted. It doesn't matter how nice if the phone would have functioned had the battery been good. And the outwardly would have been good had the heart been good. There's a relationship between them. The other extreme is what is important is the beard and your thobe above your ankles. But then afterwards you can curse, you can lie, you can cheat, you can trick the people, you can do all things that are haram. It doesn't matter because you're a, you know, uh, someone who adheres to the sunnah. We say no. You're wrong as well. We must have both. The heart has to be alive. The heart has to be mindful with Allah. Because Allah scares us in the Quran. So woe to those, woe to those whose hearts are hard concerning the remembrance of Allah. Those are in manifest misguidance. Allah said, Wailun, Wailun. Wailun lil musalleen, wailun li kulli humazatin lumaza. When wail comes, it's a threat from Allah, meaning they will be punished. And according to some of the ulama, wail is a valley in Jahannam. So severe that Jahannam seeks refuge with Allah from the severity of this valley in it. Wailun lil qasiyati qulubuhum min dhikrillah. So don't, it's not about looking with no beard, big thick beard. The, the, the beard size is not something you control. It's not about what you look like. If the, if the substance is missing, ma'alish, this could be of no value in the sight of Allah. We need both, ya akhwan. We need both. And a special lecture will be dedicated to this idea of hollow commitment. A commitment which is outwardly, but inside, there isn't a real relationship with Allah. It's fake. It's fake, only for the people, not for the sake of Allah. Very dangerous path, the path of the Khawarij. Many of the deviant groups, this was their path. In the sight of people, the Prophet said to the Sahaba, their hands will be crusty from the abundance of sujood. If you compare your salah and your fast to theirs, you will belittle yours. But they are the dogs of the hellfire. So hey, that's why the love of Allah doesn't come for you if you look according to the sunnah outside. And it will not come to you if you're pure inside and you abandon the sunnah outside. The love of Allah will come for those who purify themselves inwardly and outwardly. The love of Allah. Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabin 
المتطهرين. From now on, every time one of us sins and he repents to Allah, remember that you are acquiring Allah's love when you repent to him. Notice the term tawab. There's ta'ib. Ta'ib is a repentive person or a repenter, someone who repents. Once maybe. Tawab is called sighatul mubalagha, hyperbole, meaning it is it is exaggerated. Someone who always and often repents. Like Kathab and Kathib. Kathab is a big liar. Not a just a liar. Kathib is a liar. He may lie once a month. Kathab, he lies, a compulsive liar. Tawab, someone who's always repenting to Allah. Which indicates that they don't insist on the sin. You see, in Surah Al Imran, Allah says, when he said, وَسَارِعُ إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مَّ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةِ الْعَرْضُ وَالسَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضُ عِدَّةْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ أَلَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضَ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Pay attention now. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهُ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَلَمْ يُصِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ this is the point here. Now Allah is describing the muttaqeen, those who will be promised Jannah, those who are promised Jannah, as wide as the heavens and the earth. What are their qualities? They spend at the time of adversity and prosperity, and they suppress their anger, and they pardon the people, and Allah loves the muhsineen. And those who when they commit an abhorrent sin, fahisha ikhwan is like zina. Fahisha is that at the level of the gravity of the sin is zina and its likes. The muttaqeen may, may fall into that. Or they wrong themselves in other sins. But what is the quality of the muttaqeen? He doesn't remain absent-minded. Dhakarullah, they remember Allah. They remember Allah. Fastaghfaru, because of that they sought forgiveness for their sins. But it doesn't end. Who forgives the sins but Allah? No one. But they do not persist on the sin while they know. So you can qualify to be a taqi even if you fall into a major sin provided that you have these qualities. When you fall into the sin, you're not happy. You go to events, hey, I went out with her. You know, I finally got her. I did this, I got drunk, I got high, I got whatever. No, no, no. That's not the one who Allah will give these privileges. You may fall into these things. But when you do, you remember Allah. What have I done? What have I done? And you feel guilty. And you, say, you beg Allah for forgiveness. And you don't continue to do this while you know. You may fall back into the sin afterwards, after repentance. But at that time, you don't. Allah loves the muttaqeen. Inna Allah yuhibbul muttaqeen, which is the second ayah. So the muttaqeen, those who observe Allah's rights by doing what He commanded, avoiding what He forbade, may fall into these major sins. This is mercy from Allah. If the muttaqeen never fell into these sins, perhaps all of us will be disqualified. وَتِلْكَ الْجَنَّةُ الَّتِي نُورِثُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا مَنْ كَانَ تَقِيَّةٌ That garden, that jannah, we shall give as an inheritance from among our slaves the one who was a taqi. Meaning if you don't have to إِنَّ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ مَفَازَ Every time Allah promised jannah is for the muttaqeen, muttaqeen, muttaqeen. If a muttaqi fell into a major sin, he became disqualified, maybe none of us will make it. Mind you, major sins are not restricted to zina and drinking alcohol. They could be backbiting a Muslim, it could be doing something, slandering someone, it could be, you know, many different things which people don't consider to be major sins, but are major sins. Go back to the book of Imam al Zahabi and learn about the Kaba'ir. Uh, according to Ibn Abbas, they said he's clo they're closer to 700, not seven, 700, the major sins. We may be committing them every day, but if we turn to Allah, then Allah Azza wa Jal loves the muttaqeen. So, Inna Allah yuhibbu al-tawabeen wa yuhibbu al-mutatahireen. Inna Allah yuhibbu al-muttaqeen wa ahsinu. Inna Allah yuhibbu al-muhsineen. Ahsinu is greater than do good. Good, jayid. Ihsan is excellence. 
In other words, do work in an excellent manner. Excel, verily, Allah loves those who excel. Ihsan can never be defined by anyone better than the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, who said, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاهُ is to worship Allah as if you can see Him. That is the highest level of ibadah. Meaning you do it while looking forward to it, enjoying it, de finding delight in it. You don't want it to stop. Look, akhi, when you're standing in salah and taraweeh, you're one of two people. You're one of two people. Someone who can't wait for the imam to finish and someone who begs Allah that the imam doesn't finish. Which one are you? Do you just want to get out to, to have your, your sandwich and your, your food? Do you favor the dunya over the life to come? Do you want to run away from standing before Allah in Salah so you can have fun with your friends outside? No. That shouldn't be our attitude. Rather, you should say, why is this Imam reciting such short, short you know, ayat? Ya Sheikh, we have time. Go, Barakallah Feek. It's called Taraweeh for a reason. From Raha. So you may rest before the four rak'at. The whole Salah is resting. Today was the laziest in the world, man. I don't think even the Christians in their churches will complain if they had to stand for a couple of hours. Unfortunately for their kufr and shirk and disbelief in Allah. And the Muslims are always running, searching for the measure with the quickest Salah. Quickest Salah. For what? You don't like standing before Allah? And you don't love Allah. That's what it is. Do we realize that from among all these kuffar in the world, Allah chose you so you can make wudu in your house and go to one of his houses so he can do sujood for him? So he can forgive you and put you in Jannah? Do you realize this privilege? You think this is cheap? You think because you're so special Allah gave it to you? La wallah. It's mercy from Allah, but we don't appreciate. With this, we want to run away from Allah. Allah says, فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ Then run to Allah. And people want to run away from Allah. Salah is too long. One hour. One hour for 11 rak'at is too long. خاف Allah في نفسك. If we finish before Fajr, that would be considered taraweeh according to the Salaf. If they saw us today, they will think we're a bunch of clowns. Say, what is this? This is your taraweeh? Half a page, one page? No time for rukur, no time for sujood. You don't even can finish. Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Subhana Rabbi al You want to finish the third time, you back up. When do we supplicate to Allah? When do we feed? Because it is, it is ritualism, ya akhwan. Look, we have to understand, we should worship Allah based on love. You want, you want to be on the ground. You want to be on the floor. You want to get, be given time to beg Allah. It's not that you want to run away from that. This is Ihsan. If we don't feel this way, forget it. Because Ihsan is to worship Allah like that. Now we, we wish we could feel like this all year round. But we're weak in Ramadan. Wallah, it's easy. Allah has made it so easy in Ramadan. It's not even funny. If we can't do it in Ramadan, ya akhwan, trust me, we're way, as Al Hassan al Basri said, know that the door is closed. If in Ramadan you can't develop this, this longing for Allah, this, this need to beg Him and prostrate to Him and do salah for Him, then know that the door is closed. Because in outside Ramadan it may be difficult. In Ramadan it's easy, no shayateen, Jannah is open, Jahannam is closed. What else do you want, ya akhwan? So we need to stop playing games with ourselves. Because this is a classical example of بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ dunya. You favor the life of this world. We have no time, no problem speaking and chatting for hours and wasting time for hours. When it comes to standing before Allah, suddenly we're tired, suddenly it's fatigue. Now of course some people go against the sunnah with a long dua and it does hurt the feet. Because you know why? Wallahi, wallahi, if you were standing in salah, you don't feel the pain. If you stood in salah for 20 minutes, you don't really feel the pain in your feet. As soon as the dua goes beyond the sunnah, it hurts. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just me. But the way I feel, as soon as we go to extremes and we transgress against the sunnah, suddenly you get tired, your feet can't keep you standing anymore. You just want to sit down. 
But you didn't feel like this in the salah. Because the salah was according to the sunnah. It was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You can't pray otherwise. But that long dua was not. He taught al Hassan a few words, man. Few words. If you wish to add what Umar said, then that you have a few more words. All together, a good two minutes, and you should be done with it. That's the sunnah. Say comprehensive statements, concise and precise. Allah knows. Ask for Allah, ask Allah while being in the state of humiliation. How do you humiliate yourself? When you want to beg someone, how do you do it? Let's be frank. If you wanted to ask your boss for a vacation, do you say, my boss, let me go for one week, please? He will say, bah, get out of my office, man. You ain't, you're going all right. You're going out of this business for good. Frankly, but if you came said, excuse me, sir, one week, I really need it. And you lower your voice, you're speaking with respect, you, you're, you don't tell him a biography, blah, 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 you tell him long story, he doesn't want to hear it. He just tell me what you want. So really, I'm, what I'm saying is I'm trying to notify you that what you see all over the Muslim world is not okay. Not okay, not okay. People don't like it, don't like it. I don't want you to like it. If you don't like the sunnah, may you never like anything after the sunnah. It's not my job to make you like something that Allah doesn't want you to like. But the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, Wallah, is more beloved to us than the whole world. And the sunnah is that you don't scream and you don't yell and you don't sing and you don't elongate and you don't do the ahkam of tajweed in your dua. You beg Allah with humbleness, humiliation, just like a slave does, just like a beggar does. And you go on with your way, knowing that Allah will accept your dua. Because He promised that if you beg Him, tadarru'an wa khufya, in, in humiliation and by lowering your voice, that Allah will accept it. And he said, إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ But he does not like the transgressors. And that, that is the last of the ayah. After all said, call on Allah in humiliation and with a low voice. Verily, he does not like the transgressors. He does not love the transgressors. If you're an imam or you will be an imam, keep that in your mind. Barakallah feek. Stick to the sunnah. So, ihsan is to worship Allah in this manner. If we fail, there's level number two. فَعَلَمْ أَنْ تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَنَّ كَتَرَهُ فَإِنْ لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَكْ Then know that Allah sees you. Say what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. Where's the camera? See that camera over there? And there's another one over there. Okay? Now, we have two employees. One who works in a company without a camera, surveillance camera, and one who works in a company with surveillance cameras. How would they act? Or that same employee, when he knows that the camera is watching him and there's a, his boss is in his office, imagine if you had this weird, you know, boss who, who is yani, who always watchful over you. He actually has cameras installed in everyone's booth, you know. He sees what all the employees are doing. How would you be working? Would you be with your phone on the, you know, with your phone on the phone? Hey man, what's up? Hey, how's it going? This while you know that the guy's looking. You know, if the phone rang, you'll be like this under the table. You know, sending a text message, you know, I'll call you later. But when there's no surveillance camera, you pick up the phone and you drink coffee, tea, you name it. You know what's going on. You're laughing because you're doing it all the time, huh? <laughs> MashaAllah, tabarakallah. That's not supposed to be the case, ya khwan. But this is, this, is, this is us, human beings, weak and unmindful of Allah. Unmindful of Allah. So when you know that there's a camera watching you, suddenly you're the ideal employee who does not violate company rules. When there's nothing, no one watching over you, everything goes. If the mudir is not there, you will come late. If the mudir is there, you will come on time. This idea, apply it now when you know that and Allah is high above that. But remember that when Allah watches you, meaning you have to act like the employee who has a surveillance camera, you know, watching him the whole time. Which means when the muaddin is calling the adhan, you should not be watching a cricket match or a football match or a soap opera for this matter, nor should you be working. Working. When the Adhan is being called, there's one place for you to be if you know that Allah is watching you, and that place is the house of Allah. فِي بُيُوتٍ أَذِنَ اللَّهُ أَن تُرْفَعْ وَيُذْكَرَ فِيهَا اسْمُهُ يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ فِيهَا بِالْغُدُوِّ وَالْأَصَالِ رِجَالِ 
لا تليهم تجارة ولا بيع عن ذكر الله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة يخافون يوما تتقلب فيه القلوب والأبصار. You all know the translation of the ayah. In homes, in houses, in constructions, in masajid, which Allah commanded that they are resurrected, and in them there are, uh, you know, Allah's name is being celebrated and remembered in the day and the night by men. Whom neither business nor trade distract them from the remembrance of Allah, establishment of salah, and pain of zakah. Why? They're afraid of a day in which the hearts and the eyes, the sight will be overturned. Meaning everything will be the other way around. So ihsan is that you, if, you, if you're not dying to go to the masjid, if you can't be one of those who just want, you just want to be in the masjid, then at least feel shy when the adhan is being called to make sure that you're in the masjid. These are the two stages in the two levels. And if you do that, Allah will love you. Whether you do the first or the second, Allah will love you. If you do the first, Allah will love you more. But if you can't, and at least you are where Allah wants you to be, and you are not where Allah does not want you to be, Allah will still love you. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ The last ayah which I will quote, is perhaps the most encompassing, the most encompassing, encompassing, because it includes all of the previous ones, and it includes things which it will take years of lecturing to share with you. And it is the statement of Allah in Surah Ali Imran, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Boom. Say, first, Al-Hasan Al-Basri said, زَعَمَ أَقْوَابٌ أَنَّهُمْ يُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَابْتَلَاهُمْ بِهَذِهِ الْآيَةِ فَابْتَلَاهُمْ بِهَذِهِ الْآيَةِ And the scholar said, this is the ayah of testing. It's that, that distinction, the criterion. Say, meaning Allah is instructing our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say to everyone in the world, Muslims and non-Muslims. And on his behalf sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as people who convey the message of Islam, as he conveyed the message of Islam, we say in turn to the people, any human being, Jew, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, atheist, anyone, if you or atheist is disqualified because he doesn't even believe in God. Anyone else? Specifically the Christians. If you claim that you love God, if you claim that you love Allah, then Allah has placed the test so that you may prove that you love Allah. Ittabi'uni. Fattabi'uni. Then follow me. Who? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What happens? There's a paradox there. Look, if you want to prove to Allah that you sincerely love Him, then Allah said, follow my Messenger. You expect the ayah to say, then you have proven that you love Allah. You claim you love Allah, follow the Messenger, you pass the exam. Now we can say, Fulan sincerely loves Allah. But that's not what happens. When you do that, Allah, Allah will love you. وَالشَّأْنُ كُلَّ الشَّأْنِ أَوْ كُلُّ شَأْنِ أَنْ يُحِبَّكَ اللَّهِ لَا أَنْ تُحِبَّ اللَّهِ The whole matter is if Allah loves you, not if you love Allah. If you love Allah, good for you. But if Allah loves you, what else do you want? What else do you want? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ سَيَجْعَلُوا لَهُمُ الرَّحْمَانُ وُدَّى very those who believe and do righteous deeds, Allah shall make for them love. What does that mean? Meaning Allah will love them, and the people will love them, and everything which Allah created will love these people in this dunya and in the life to come. So the whole thing has to do with following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyone who claims to love Allah, we will say you are a liar until you follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a false claim until you follow the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because Allah said so. 
Not that I'm trying to make things difficult for you, but Allah told us, if you love Allah, فَاتَّبِعُونِي Allah will love you. So no one can claim that he loves Allah while going against the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Question, how many Muslims today deliberately go against the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Allahul Musta'an. And you know what's unfortunate, ya akhwan? That it is not restricted to the regular people. No! Scholars or so-called scholars and du'at propagators, inviters of Islam and a list of people who are categorized as those who are on the sunnah. Sometimes they are the first to go against the sunnah. So they mislead themselves and they mislead others in the process. It's a calamity upon the ummah because imagine, imagine if you were a student of the Sahaba. By Allah, which one of them will be misleading you from the Sunnah? None. None of them. If you were a student of the Tabi'een, which one of you will be misleading you from the Sunnah? None. But today, you have to go through a long list and a lot of conditions and criteria to say Fulan is upon the sunnah, I can learn from him. After fetching, you have a list of 100 people, you can take out two of them and say, these are people of the sunnah, sincerely and strictly. Otherwise, you have to filter this guy off, this guy off, that guy off, this lady. You have a list of people calling you to Sufism, calling you to themselves, calling you to a group, calling you to something. Ya yeah, subhanallah, where's وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ who is better in speech than he who calls to Allah, not to any group, not to any Shaykh Mawlana, call to Allah. And the deen of Allah is preserved and protected with the sunnah of the Prophet So ya akhwan, this idea of following the sunnah, bringing about Allah's love is the most mesmerizing indeed. Ya yeah, subhanallah, a bottle of water, a bottle of water. I'm not trying to advertise this company. I got this for free. Don't think I pay eight riyals for a bottle of water. Okay, I gave a lecture. They said, this is for you. I said, Jazakallah khairan. I'll use it when I play basketball. Now, two Muslims can have a bottle of water. And two Muslims can drink. One of them will attain Allah's love when he drinks. And the other one will not. He may be cursed. I was at al Bayk with this brother yesterday. Observing. From what I saw, 80% of the people drink with the left hand. Muslims, 80% of the Muslims. Wallah, it doesn't even cross his mind, ya Sheikh. It, and, and, and the worst is when you say, Akhi bil Yameen, he looks at you like, mind your business, you know? I'm having my chicken here, and I want to enjoy it the way I want to enjoy it. He doesn't even have yani, the humbleness or the Iman which allows him to say, Jazakallahu khairan for the reminder. And he actually switches. Very few that I've come across in my life. Wallahi, very few, you would be shocked, who actually say, Jazakallahu khairan and change. Many people look at me like this. Like, in your face, I'm going to drink with the left hand. What are you going to do? Hey, what am I going to say? Let's take it outside and go punch, you know, knock him out. See, this is not that way anymore. You know? It's like, you know, Mike Tyson back in the days. You know, the, the journalist will ask him a question that is not right, bow, he will knock him out. Nothing, you know, you can't play with Mike Tyson back then. You say he became a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, may Allah guide him to the sunnah. But the idea is, well, you can't do this in da'wah. And you can't really fight with the people, you know, you know, pick a fight with them because he ignores you. You just say, la ilaha illallah, akhi, what, what happened to you? Yeah, shabab, this sunnah and drinking, sitting down, saying, bismillah. Drinking with two or three breaths because the narration is mentioned two or three and not breathing into the container and taking a breath in between them and not gulping a big gulp and saying Alhamdulillah at the end will attain Allah's love. Yeah, subhanAllah, you're drinking water anyways because you're thirsty anyways and you will dehydrate if you don't drink anyways. But you can attain Allah's love while the other one is getting the shaitan to drink with him. He's resembling shaitan who drinks with his left hand. And if he were in the presence of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he told him like that other guy, like that other Sahabi, he told him, 
كل بيمينك قال لا استطيع قال لا استطعت he told him i can't he told him may you never be able to do so and the sahaba said nothing prevented that man except arrogance yani it even happened to the messenger of allah he told the person eat with the right hand he said i'm unable to do so he's able can anyone not eat with his right hand wallah liar which reminds me some people play games with themselves oh look okay, look they buy a pepsi okay now let me ask you a question which one of you takes the pepsi home after he's done with it and he puts it in, in the, on the shelf anyone do you throw it away in the trash you throw it in the trash or some people yani mashallah yani uh, he doesn't like to get the things greasy so because he's drinking with he's eating with his right hand his hand is what greasy so as an excuse now he wants to drink the pepsi with the left hand if you tell him why he says because my hand is greasy and Grab the Pepsi with the greasy hand when you finish it, throw it in the trash. Or they go like this. <laughs> oh, now this finger, this magical finger, I guess, is supposed to convert the drinking from the left hand to drinking with the right hand. So they go like this, they go like this. What is this? Ya Habib Albi, you will throw it in the trash. Ya Sheikh, get it greasy, no problem. Put a mandil around it. But you have to drink with the right. So one sandwich in the left and right. So they say, you know, like this. No. If you're a Muslim, you will have to put one down, then eat the sandwich. Put it down, drink. Put it down like this. There's ajr for it. And you will bring about Allah's love with this very, very simple deed. And I'm mentioning little things. Listen, I'm mentioning voluntary things sometimes or some... Don't speak about the obligations, ya akhwan. If we go against the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the obligations, with the Sunnah, which we've spoken about in many, many lectures, then we're not only not attaining Allah's love, no, we are on a one-way path to Jahannam. You better believe. I'm not speaking about obligations. Obligations, you have to be upon the Sunnah, period. We're talking about voluntary acts of worship. So as a Muslim, ya akhi, be mindful of Allah. Learn the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. How he ate, how he drank, how he dealt with issues, how he treated his wives, how he treated his children, how he gave da'wah. Learn, apply. Every time you do so with this niyyah of yours, Allah will love you. If you don't, listen to the ayah. قُلْ أَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولُ فَإِن تَوَلَّوْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ The very next ayah after the one I quoted right now, Say, obey Allah and His Messenger, but if they turn away, then verily Allah does not love the disbelievers. Yani Allah saying, if you don't want to listen to the Sunnah, if you don't want the Sunnah, if the Sunnah is no good for you, then Allah does not love people who have a quality of disbelief or the disbelievers altogether. Because going against the Sunnah is a quality of disbelief. So, yani ihtasib, anticipate the ajr for everything you do according to the sunnah. Be mindful of Allah in everything which you know is from the sunnah because this is means of attaining Allah's love. In conclusion, you may say, brother, what do I get for all of this? What you get is the hadith which I've been saving for the end of the lecture. But in it is the title of the lecture. The hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu in the sahih, radiallahu anhu in the sahih, وَإِنْ the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا نَادَى جِبْرِيلٍ فَيَقُولْ إِنِّي أُحِبُّ فُلَانًا فَأَحِبَّهُ فَيُحِبُّهُ جِبْرِيلٍ ثُمَّ يُنَادِي فِي السَّمَاءِ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ فُلَانًا فَأَحِبُّهُ فَيُحِبُّهُ أَهْلُ السَّمَاءِ ثُمَّ يُوضَعُ لَهُ الْقَبُولُ فِي الْأَرْضِ when Allah loves a slave, it doesn't end there. It could end there if Allah will, but no. Now listen to this, this is mind boggling. This is, this is just too much. This, is too, this hadith is too much. As in it's so powerful, if you were to reflect on it, you should be, you should, you know, maybe faint. Please turn off the phones. When Allah loves a slave, he calls on Jibreel. Who's Jibreel? 
You know who Jibreel is? The greatest of the Malaika, as far as Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The one whom when the Prophet وسلم, saw, he fainted alayhi salatu salam because of his wings had covered the horizon. Jibreel, the, the angel who's responsible for the most virtuous thing, which is conveying the revelation from Allah to the messengers of Allah. Jibreel, and what do you know about Jibreel? Allah said, whoever is adu, whoever is an enemy to, to Jibreel, then Allah is the enemy to the disbelievers. Allah defended Jibreel in the Quran. Jibreel, Jibreel, the one who took the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Al Isra Al Mi'raj in the ascension to the heavens. Jibreel, the the the, the Malak, which we we don't know what to say about because of his honor and his virtue in the sight of Allah. Allah will call on him to share with him the love which he has for you. Allah doesn't need to do this. He could, he could not do this. But Allah likes to do this. So he does it. He says, I love Fulan. Now I want you to think that Fulan is you. Whatever your name is, Ahmad, Mayruq, uh, you know, whatever your name is. Imagine Allah in the above the heavens, above the throne, in His greatness, in His majesty, which is beyond our human comprehension, calls out to Jibreel to inform him that He loves you. And then only that. فَأَحِبَّهُ Then He commands Jibreel to love you also. So Jibreel now loves you. Allah and Jibreel love you. But it doesn't end there. Jibreel then will call upon the inhabitants of the Sama. Who are they? All the Malaika. How many? We can even count trillions and trillions of Malaika which Allah created beyond our, again, human comprehension. All of them are commanded simultaneously to love you. First Jibreel says, Allah loves Fulan, so now you have to love him. Then all of the angels in the heavens love you. Then Allah will place acceptance for you on earth. So people will love you. Not everyone. You may be saying, why do I have enemies? People who love the Sunnah will love you. The people who love Allah and His Messenger will love you. The people who are upon the correct Aqeedah and methodology will love you. Other people may hate you because of a problem in them, not because of a problem in you. Because you may say, well this, you know, this fasik, this evil, disobedient person doesn't love me. Don't expect him to love you. He loves people like himself. Who will love you? Righteous people. Righteous people. Well, they don't know why. They don't even know why. They've, you've never even given them a dollar or a real or a pound. You've never done anything for them. Maybe you scream at them. Maybe you do other things. It's Allah. Why? Because Allah had loved you first, then Jibreel had loved you first, then the Malaika loved you afterwards, then Allah put acceptance for you on earth, so people have no choice but to love you. We ask Allah to make us among them. Amen. Now what better than that? What else do you want? What else do you want? What? What? If you're a person whom Allah loves, in every movement you go, you do, you pray, you sleep, you, whatever you do, you are among those whom Allah loves and Jibreel loves and the angel loves. What else do you want, ya akhi? You're guaranteed success in this life and in the life to come. Guaranteed. No way Allah will punish you. No way. No way Allah will punish someone whom He loves. But the hadith doesn't stop. The hadith has a very saddening continuation. Which we should seek refuge with Allah from. وَإِذَا أَبْغَضَ عَبْدًا And if Allah hates a slave, He also calls on Jibreel. And He informs Jibreel that He hates this person. So He will command Jibreel to hate this person. Then Jibreel will tell the angels to hate this person. Then Allah will put hatred for him on earth. لا إله إلا الله. Imagine you walking upon the planet, the face of the earth which Allah created, while Allah hates you, and the angels hate you, and Jibreel hate you, and the righteous people hate you. What a sad state for a human being. And when we could be one of those as well. If you are prideful, arrogant, you are qualified for this hatred because Allah does not love كل متكبرين. Uh, Jabbar, Allah does not love the arrogant, the prideful. If you go against the Sunnah, then Allah does not love those who go against the Sunnah.
if you don't observe taqwa and you don't observe ihsan and you don't observe tawbah and tatahur, then again we are disqualified. If you, many things which we can mention, many things which will bring about Allah's hatred and deprive, of, deprive us of Allah's love, it's a very sensitive situation, meaning right now, right now, you have to be one of these two. Either Allah loves you or He doesn't. But there's always good news even for those people whom we can be amongst. It's not too late because you're alive. It's not too late because it's Ramadan. It's not too late because you're breathing. Even if you led a life of someone who had attained Allah's hatred, if you were to return to Allah, then Allah will love you and be happier. He would be so happy with your tawbah than a man who lost his mount in the desert, upon it was his food and his drink, and then he waited under a tree for death, and all of a sudden he opened his eyes and he sees his camel or his horse or whatever that was right in front of him. And he gets so happy, he said, Allahumma anta abdi wa ana rabbuka. Oh Allah, you are my slave and I am your Lord. Kufur. He said a statement of kufr, but the Prophet ﷺ said, أَخْطَأَ مِنْ شِدَّةِ الْفَرَحِ He made a mistake because he's so happy. You know when you're so happy that you may say things against what you want to say? When you're so happy that you just, you know, you say words that mean nothing to anyone? Allah is happier when you return to Him than that person. What else do we want? For how long are we going to stay away from Allah? For how long are we going to lead the life of the heedless? For how long are we going to go against the sunnah? What are you waiting for? Death? Death? Until when death comes to one of them, you say, Oh Allah, allow me to return so that I may do good. In that which I left behind, and it will be said to him, No, it's only a word. It's nothing but a wish and a word he will have. It will not be fulfilled. Let us not wait for death, ya akhwan. If each one of us here, by Allah, by Allah, if each one of us here acted upon the sunnah, lived according to the sunnah, and invited people to the sunnah, and enjoyed what is good, and forbade what is evil, wallah, we will make a major change in the city in which we live. And if Muslims, Yangis, all over the world had that same attitude, then we will change the condition of the whole ummah. So no enemy can come and play games with us. We will squash them, all of them. Because Allah will defend. In Allah, yansurkum wa yuthabbit aqdamakum. If you aid Allah's deen, Allah will aid you and will keep your feet firm. But we don't even live according to the sunnah, let alone be given victory over the enemies. So we're being humiliated and everywhere we go in the world. So let us make that change. Now that Ramadan is here, now that you've been given this, this, this sudden inclination towards good, if we don't succeed, if we don't take advantage of this month, wallahi, we are losers. If Ramadan ends and you are the same way you were before Ramadan began, then one of us is a loser. If we don't return to Allah after Ramadan, then we are losers as well. So tonight, bi-ithnillah, always on our mind, attaining Allah's love, acquiring Allah's love, fetching for the sunnah, and acting upon it whenever we're able to do so. If you do this, then you can expect the unexpected. You can see from Allah's facilitation and mercy and love and, and things with compassion that words cannot even begin to describe. And if you don't believe me and you don't have to believe me, read the stories of the Salaf. Read the biographies, biographies of the Sahaba. Read Mus'ab bin Umayr, read Ali bin Abi Talib, read Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, read, read all of the all of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Ulama. Wallahi, some of them led lives which we, we could never even begin to deal with. And they were the happiest people on earth. 
Allah guided them in every affair and I always quote Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah because he is the most classical example. A man who died in prison for fatwa, for the deen of Allah. A man who died in prison telling the people, ma yasna'u a'da'ibi, what will my enemies do to me? My garden, my jannah, bustani fi sadri, it's in my chest. They can handcuff your arms, but they ha cannot handcuff your heart. They can put you in, in by yourself in a cell, but they cannot keep you away from Allah. They cannot keep you away from Allah. This was the iman of this man, whom Allah Azza wa Jal guided until he died, until today. Wallahi, the people of the Sunnah love Shaykh al-Islam more than their fathers. They love him, they don't even know why. Never seen him, never met him, never nothing. Just you say Shaykh al-Sahib ibn Taymiyyah and you say La ilaha illallah, radiyallahu anhu, rahimahullah. You love him, you don't know why, you don't even know what to say. And any scholar upon the Sunnah, when we speak of Shaykh bin Baz, Shaykh bin Uthami, Shaykh al-Bani, Wallah, in the hearts of the people of Sunnah, there's love which you cannot even begin to express. Why? Because what we know of them is that they, left, they lived according to the Sunnah and they taught to the people. You do the same, you will get the same privilege. You will, lead, you will lead the life of the content and you will die the life of the content and you will be resurrected content and you will enjoy Jannah in the company of the Prophet ﷺ for eternity. Do not disqualify yourself from the company of the Prophet ﷺ because of some mundane, lowly things. وَمَن يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ فَأُولَئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصُّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَئِكَ رَفِيقًا If you obey Allah's Messenger, this is what will you be in the company of those whom Allah has bestowed His favors upon from among the Prophets. On top of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. الْمَرْءُ مَعْ مَنْ أَحَبْ The man will be in the company of the one whom he loves. You love the Messenger of Allah, that means you must follow him. If you follow him, you will be with him in Jannah. Why? This is Fadlullah, yu'tihi may yasha. This is the bounty of Allah, He gives it to whosoever He wills. No one can come say, you're going to be with the message of Allah? Yes, you. Because Allah wants it to be this way. How? If you do the necessary. If you have lived by the Sunnah and acquired Allah's love. So this should be the, the mentality of the Muslim in his life. Striving and striving until you meet Allah. And if we do so, then we, can, we have the best assumption about Allah Azza wa Jal that He will fulfill His promise and He will give us what we long for and He will make us enjoy looking at His face subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah and He will make us among those whom He will honor and bless in this life and in life to come. Verily, He is able to do all things. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان